You know, I could preach to a lot of heads out here, but I don't want to preach to heads. I want to preach to spirits, to hearts. I don't want it to just get in your head and then you just forget it. I want it to go into your spirit and affect you. So I'm asking you right now to just say a prayer with me that, Lord, let this, let this enter my spirit. Let it change my life. Heavenly Father, right now, we just open ourselves up to your word. Your word is powerful. And Lord Jesus, we do not want to be those that are dull of hearing. We do not, don't, do not want to be those that reject your word, but we want to allow your word to powerfully be implanted in our hearts, to bear, uh, to bear fruit, and to cause us to be transformed into your image, Lord. So right now, we open up our hearts. We set our minds aside, but open our hearts up to you, Father, and say, Lord, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the title of the message today is The Illusion of Lack, all right? Now, since my childhood, I've had a fascination with magicians and magic performances, okay? Now, I'm not talking about black magic. I'm talking about illusionist. So during the early days of Magic X, many magicians would market themselves as people who had otherworldly powers, they had supernatural powers, and often those powers were attributed to spirits of darkness and to the occult. So that made them kind of spooky and mysterious. And most of that was just hype. Most of that was not real at all. It's just hype. They really didn't have any supernatural powers. They were ordinary people that had clever tricks, clever sleight of hand, okay? Harry Houdini showed up in the early days of magic, the vaudeville days, and uh, he kind of changed the, the picture of things because he showed up at a time in history where spiritualism, a thing called spiritualism, was running rapid. And suddenly, lots of people were into occultic practices like, oh, Ouija boards, that's cool. Oh, crystal balls, that's cool. Palm reading, oh, that's, this is exciting. There's another world out there. And people were getting into that. And Harry Houdini stepped on the scene. He says, I want to, you know, debunk all this. Most of this stuff is flim flam. Most of this stuff is done by people who are trying to separate you from your money right? Most of this stuff is a scam. And when they say they're talking to your dead grandfather, whatever, most of it is just a scam. So he debunked whole lots of these spiritual, spiritual, spiritualist leaders. He made it his, his mission to expose all the fake spiritualism practices that were going on that were just tricks to get people's money. And from that point on, many magicians no longer called themselves magicians, no longer said they they worked under the power of dark spirits, but they called themselves illusionist, an illusionist. So like people like, um, you know, like um, David, David Copperfield, he's an illusionist. He's saying, I'm not doing this by magic, real magic, but it looks like it, doesn't it? It's an illusion, okay? So an illusionist is a person that performs tricks or illusions that appear to be miraculous or impossible, but admittedly they're just tricks. They fool your eyes, they fool your brains into thinking you saw something that you really did not see, okay? My wife and I have been, I don't know if it was once or twice we saw David Copperfield. Was one time. We went to see David Copperfield one time, many years ago when he was in his heyday. And it was a live performance, and it looked like he flew over the audience, no strings attached, just flew over the audience. It looked like, that's what it looked like. It looked like he sawed his body in half, and both halves moved as if they were alive. That's what it looked like. It looked like he dematerialized from hanging high above the stage, sitting on a motorcycle, and reappeared instantly behind us in the audience, in where the seats were, on a motorcycle. That's a pretty good trick, isn't it? He was up there one minute going, hi, and poof, next minute he's behind us, vroom, vroom, in a motorcycle. It's like, how, how did he get back there? It looked like it was real magic, but you know, our eyes can be fooled. It can appear real. It fools our brain. Our eyes can be fooled, and they think they saw something that really they didn't see. And over the years, I've learned how many of these tricks have been done. I know how they're done, many of them. And now when I see some of these tricks performed, I already know how they're done. So I see them in a whole different light. I look at them and I go, yeah, okay, well, look behind his back. That's what's happening. You know, <laughs> the, the, the magic is gone from them because I know how they work. I realize that people out there with their eyes wide open, their jaws dropped, are going, wow, it really did disappear. I'm realizing, no, you just been suckered. 
okay? You've just been fooled. Illusionist. What are illusionists about? They're actually about deception, okay? They're out there to deceive you. What they're claiming to do is actually not what they're actually doing. It's a lie that appears to be real, okay? They never really did saw any ladies in half that I know about, okay? Have you ever seen a lady sawn in half? I have. You have, okay. They never really did make a rabbit disappear and vanish into thin air. They, they never really did, okay? They never really did read your mind to determine which card you chose. They, they never really did that. They just successfully deceived you into believing that. Now, deception is a very powerful tool. In the hands of your enemy, it's a very powerful weapon, right? During D-Day, World War II, the United States military, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but if you haven't seen this, just look it up on YouTube, you'll, you'll be amazed. The United States military wanted to deceive the Germans. So they wanted them not to know that they were going to attack on the Normandy coast, but somewhere else. So they created, and you can see these on YouTube, inflatable tanks, cannons, trucks, whole, just f soldiers, all these inflatables, they could, two guys could pick up a tank and carry it. And from the air, it looked just like a tank. It looked just like a truck. So they created all these areas where all these tanks were moving and all these troops were moving. So the Germans would go, aha, they're going to attack from that front. But it was all fake. It was a deception. And it worked. They fell for it. They sent a lot of their troops to these areas where these inflatable tanks were. And they were fighting just the air, right? They missed. They weren't there on the Normandy coast for D-Day. So as a result of this illusion, they were defeated. Now, what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is this. We have an enemy. He is a deceiver. In fact, deception is one of the only things he ever originated and, cre and created himself. Most everything else, he's just ripped somebody else off. But lies, that was his thing. He's the one who was the father of lies, okay? Revelation 12:9 says this, so the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast down with him. He deceives the whole world. He's an illusionist. Things appear to be a certain way, but they're really not that way because he's a deceiver. He's a liar. John 8, 43 through 44. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you're unable to accept my message. Now, Jesus was talking to some Pharisees who didn't accept Jesus, who is the truth. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and he's the father of it. He's the originator of lies. He's the one. So Jesus calls your enemy and my enemy the father of lies, the author of deception. He is the first master illusionist. The devil is the father of lies, and lies blind people to truth so that they will continue to walk in darkness and in deception. But God, our father, on the other hand, isn't about keeping the truth from you, but he's about exposing you to the truth. He doesn't want to leave you in the dark, but he wants to bring light into your life so that you can see what is real, what is true. Instead of being the father of lies, he's the father of something else. In James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, comes down from the father of lights, with him whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He's the father of lights. He illuminates things so that you can see what's really there, so that you can see the truth. But the devil is still busy on the job, covering things and keeping you in darkness so that you won't get it, so that you'll believe the lie. You'll fall for the illusion, right? Because if he can make the illusion good enough, he can even make Jesus disappear from your life. He can make it look like there is no God. There is no Jesus. It's all just natural things happening on earth, and, and there really is no supernatural realm. Well, you know what? If the devil could be, uh, if your enemy, and the devil's your enemy, if he could be invisible to you, that makes him a whole lot more, uh, um, a whole lot more effective in, in tricking you. So the devil's invisible. He wants you to see Jesus as invisible, and he doesn't want you to see the truth because the truth will set you free, and the truth will get you out of the enemy's camp and put you into God's kingdom, Right? So, Satan is known as the prince of darkness. But Jesus is known as the light 
of the world. The devil delivers clearly, uh, cleverly crafted lies that keep people in darkness. But God's Spirit gives us light, and he shows us the truth. And Jesus came as the manifest representation of God's light and his truth. So we're going to look at John, a couple verses here. John 8, 12 says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the one who came to illuminate the truth. 1 John 1, 5 through 6, and this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. Verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him was nothing made that has been made. For in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the light of the world. But if you reject Jesus, the only thing that can take its place is darkness. You reject light, and all you can have is darkness. And when you're in darkness, it's very easy to be deceived. It's very easy to not see the truth, isn't it? Okay? A skilled illusionist can make a person believe something to be absolutely true, absolutely real, that actually is neither true nor real, but you've been fooled. You've been deceived. Do you think that once you got born again, the enemy gave up on trying to deceive you? You think that's what I, you got the light, so now it's all clear. Oh, no, no. He will try around every corner that, that you turn to show, to, to cover up the truth, to cover up the truth so that you can't continue to walk and grow in the truth, okay? He's still the same deceiver who tricked Adam and Eve into believing that they didn't have something that they really should have. They really had everything they needed, but he said, you yeah, know, God's holding something out on you. There's something that you don't have, and you really should want it, right? They had the knowledge of good, but they didn't have the knowledge of evil, did they? The devil convinced them that they were missing out on something, because there's a knowledge you don't have. He convinced them that God didn't want to share that knowledge with them, because he wanted to have it all to himself. They were the first people who were sold what the title of this message is. They were sold the illusion of lack. They didn't lack anything, but they were sold the illusion that they lacked something. There's something God is withholding from you. There's something that is magnificent that if only you knew, but God's keeping it from you. You don't have that, do you? No, we don't. Well, then you're missing out. God doesn't want you to have it either because he's holding out on you. Because if you did have it, you'd be just as big a deal as he is, right? He sold Adam and Eve the illusion that they lacked something. There's something you don't have. Oh, you don't have that? Well, I've got that, and God has that, but you don't have that? You're missing out, okay? They had every good thing, but they didn't have everything. Now, do you want everything, or do you want every good thing? You know, there's a lot of things I don't want. There's a lot of things I don't have that I never want. You know, I don't want cancer. I don't have it, and I don't want it. Yeah, you know, I don't have uh, blindness. I, I don't have it, and I don't want it. You know, I don't have an unsaved wife, thank God. I have a saved wife. I want to keep that. There's a lot of things I don't have. You know, I don't have herpes. I'm glad I don't have that. Thank God. Don't want it. Don't want it. Yeah, you're missing out on something. I'm okay missing out on that. How about you? Right? Okay. Okay. So God is a good father, and he warned his children not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he was protecting them. He said, if you eat that thing, you'll die. But here's what the deceiver, the devil said, Genesis 3, 4 through 6, you will not surely die. What? But God said you will. Yeah, but I'm saying you won't. He's just trying to trick you. He's trying to keep you away from what's good. He said, you will not surely die, the serpent told Eve, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and, good and evil. Oh, Evil, don't know what that is, but I don't know it, so maybe it's a good thing to have. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom, she took of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. 
They bought the lie. They swallowed the lie, didn't they? They swallowed it. She was sold a bill of goods that said, there's something that you lack, and you won't be complete until you get it. You got to get it for yourself. She lacks no good thing, only bad things. Upon this very principle hangs much of the psychology of marketing, commercials. 30 or 60 seconds is all it takes to convince you that you lack something that you really need or that you really want, you really should have. I remember, now, you know, I'm older than some of you folks, I realize that, but I remember in the 70s, okay? I was a teenager in the 70s. I remember in the 70s that we were all told, everybody was told that every modern house and modern kitchen should have a trash compactor. True? You should all have one. In fact, you, you don't have one? Everybody needs one. It's an important thing. Every house can't function without a trash compactor. Every house that was new being built, they'd put it on the market in the track homes and it says, and it has a dish, dishwasher and a trash compactor. Oh, gosh, it's got a trash compactor. I got to have that house. I want my kitchen redone and make space for a trash compactor. Take out a few cupboards and put in a trash compactor because everybody needs that. That's what we were told. How did we ever live without a trash compactor? <laughs> Everyone who was anyone had to have one. They were essential for modern living. Now, let me ask you a question. Be honest. Does anyone here have a trash compactor? <gasps> did anyone here ever have a trash compactor? How did you survive? How did you make it? You poor people. You pathetic people. We need to pray for you. You gotta have more faith, because if you have enough faith, you could have a trash compactor in your house right now. What is wrong with you people? Man, well, the commercial said we couldn't live without it. And the magazines told us every modern kitchen has one. And you need to get one as soon as possible. Now, I remember when every house had hardwood floors. But what you should really have is wall to wall carpeting. That's living a life of luxury. In fact, carpets with the longer fibers were the ones you should really get. You should get shag. Shag. Avocado green shag with a little harvest gold mixed in for good measure. If you don't have shag carpeting, you are living in poverty. You are missing out. I mean, you have those, those horrible, cold, hard, old-fashioned hardwood floors. You poor thing. In fact, if you really want to go out, you put shag in your bathroom and your kitchen. We all needed it. That's what the magazines told us. And if you didn't have it, you were missing out. And every new house had it, right? Then there was a hot tub. Everybody who's in the in crowd needs a hot tub because a hot tub, that's a place of party. That's, I mean, if you want to have people come over to your house, you get a hot tub. And you've got to have a hot tub. And you've got to make room for a hot tub and build a deck for a hot tub and put a patio out for it just so you can have a hot tub because everybody needs a hot tub. If you don't have a hot tub, you're not with it. You're in the out crowd, not the in crowd. But after a while, after every home had to have one and every new home they had to say, and it has a hot tub, then people started to realize it costs an arm and a leg to keep that thing hot. And they only used them once in a while. And they were the perfect breeding ground for every bacteria on earth. They were a giant petri dish. Jump in my hot tub. Let's see what you get. <laughs> Do you know what you need today? You know what you need today? You need an iPhone with six cameras. Because one camera has never been enough. Right? In fact, three cameras aren't enough anymore. Because they were enough a few years ago, but now three? <laughs> You're missing out. You're lacking. You're lacking three more cameras. You need six cameras. You need cameras all over that phone. You know? In fact, you need six cameras right now, and, and if you get it right now, you're in. But next year, you're going to be out because there'll be eight cameras. And you'll be lacking another two cameras. What are you going to do if you only live life with six cameras? How are you going to make it? How are you going to make it? I mean, you don't have one yet? I feel sorry for you. How do you even make it each day? 
without six cameras. There are a lot of things that we don't have that we don't need. And that doesn't mean that we're living in lack because we don't have them. I lack a good cigarette lighter. It's okay, I'm fine. I lack a good snow cone machine. I'm going to be all right. Okay? I'm fine. I will survive without a snow cone machine or a cigarette lighter. Now, you may be asking why I've taken you down this road, and it's to show you the light, the truth found in the Word of God so that you can have everything you will ever need and never be in the place of lack because lack's an illusion. The first thing to understand is that if you already have something, then you don't need to feel the lack in that area. And so the devil can do this. See, God gives us so many things that we sometimes have been, uh, um, our eyes have been blinded to that we don't even realize what we have. And when you don't realize what you have, you feel the lack even though you already have it. And the devil, all he has to do is hide your eyes from what you have. All he has to do is put a little darkness over what you have so that you say, I lack. God, God has let me down. I lack in my life. If you already have something, you need to wake up to what you have. And the Word of God tells you what you have. The second thing to understand is that you have an enemy. He's a liar, and his motives towards you are evil. And the enemy is at war with you as a believer, and deception and illusion are some of his greatest weapons. So be aware of how he operates. If the enemy can't take it from you, what God's given you, then there's another way that he can attack you. He can convince you you don't have what you have. And they go, oh, God missed out on me. When I was standing in line, I didn't get what God was handing to everybody else, right? He doesn't even have to take it from you. All he needs to do is blind your eyes of your understanding so that you can't see it. And if he can effectively keep you in the dark concerning what God has given you, then he could fool you into believing that God's holding out on you and you are in lack. If he can do that, it'll cause you to feel lack. It will keep you from experiencing a thing called contentment contentment, okay? If you cannot experience contentment, that's going to keep you in a place of unthankfulness. You see, it's a road that you, when you go down that road, it goes worse and worse until the place is, is that you, you, you don't even love God because he's, he hasn't given you what you need, and you lack so much in your life, and you can't be thankful because you don't have this stuff that you need, and not realizing, actually, he's given you everything you need, right? Right? Instead, of living a life where you are, have gratitude and thankfulness, you live a life of feeling you're perpetually in a state of lack. And the devil wants you to feel discontented. He wants you to feel like you're in this place of lack. This isn't confined to material things. It's also can be in areas of spiritual things. Our problem many times is that the greatest illusionist, the devil, has expertly created the illusion of lack in our lives so that we can never live in a place of gratitude, of thankfulness, of contentment. Some of it starts in our minds because they're the easiest thing for them to fool. And then it grows in power and influence and it invades every aspect of our lives. It can, it can invade your spiritual life, your emotional life, your relational life, your creativity, your physical life. The list goes on and on because the devil has sold you a lie that you don't have. You don't have and you need the illusion that you can't do what you really want to do in life because you lack something. I would do that, but I, I don't have what it takes. You see, the devil wants to keep you paralyzed. He wants to keep you in a place uh, under subjection like you're a slave, that you don't have power, right? You don't have the resources. You don't have what it takes. And God is saying, I've given you everything it takes. You know, you're convinced that you can't do some things in life because, uh, you know, you lack the level of education that's needed? Well, I'm going to tell you something, okay? My wife, okay? It's just the truth. My wife has had jobs that she would probably need several degrees for. It's true. And, and you know what? She has a high school diploma. That's it. But she's had those jobs, and she's done exceedingly well at these jobs. Jobs that she would need certificates and programs and college education. She didn't have that, but she excelled because the Lord was with her. She could have said, I can't apply for that job because I don't have a degree in that, but she didn't. God just promoted her because promotion comes from the Lord, right? 
She could have said, I lack a degree, so I can't go on. And in fact, even when she's in the midst of the job, she even thought sometimes, maybe out of, while I'm doing it, I just get a degree in it because I'm doing it. And it's like, why? You're doing it. She never lacked. Never lacked. God's always promoted her, escalated it. Right? But some people say, I can't do that because I don't have a bachelor's degree. So they go and they get a bachelor's degree. And I'm not putting down education. I'm just saying, you don't lack. You have God on your side. Okay? So I'm not putting down education. So they, but, but some people, they let the education be the thing the devil will sell them and say, if you don't have this, you can't do it. Well, actually, if God's with you, you can do whatever he tells you you can do. So anyway, you don't have a bachelor's degree, so you feel insecure about applying for that job, so you say, I'll get a master's degree then. So you get the master's degree. And you go, you know, I, I know I could maybe apply now, but there's people applying that have doctorates. Maybe I need to get a doctorate. And you just keep going and saying, I never have enough. I'm never quite there. Now I don't have experience. I never quite have enough, so I can't do what I want to do. And God says, that's not true. I've supplied you with everything you need. You just need to have faith, step out there, and watch what I do. Okay? You always lack that next thing, and it stops you from enjoying what you already have. You're not pretty enough. You're not strong enough. You're not clever enough. You're not creative enough. No matter what level you reach, you still feel like you lack something. Right? Right? If only I were prettier, I could do that. You know, if only I was smarter, I could do that. Well, there's lots of people, forgive me, there's lots of people that are dumb and not pretty who are multimillionaires and they did it anyway, right? So we can do anything God gives us the power to do. Your nose isn't small enough, your lips aren't full enough, your eyes aren't blue enough. You can never reach a place where you say, I finally have it all, I'm content. Because you're in lack. Always something. How can you be thankful when all you see in your life is that you never have enough? How do you walk in thankfulness? When you know you're missing out and there's something better, but you don't have it, it's easy to go, I'd be thankful if I just had that. Your enemy knows what you have, but he doesn't want you to know what you have. Because if you did, you would walk in confidence. You would walk in power. You'd walk in joy and contentment and thankfulness. If you were to spend some time in a third world country, any of us in a third world country, you would see that most people there don't feel lack. In many areas, we feel lack because they, like, they don't feel lack that they don't have a car that will park itself. They don't feel lack at all for that. They'll say, oh my gosh, we'd be so much better if we had a car that could park itself. They really couldn't care less. Okay? That isn't even on their list of needs. They feel that they would be completely contented if they just had a regular source of food for their family. And a warm place to sleep every night. They'd say, I've got it all. Yeah. Well, don't they lack a com trash compactor? Yeah, but they don't care. They don't feel a lack because their big screen TV isn't bigger, as big as yours, right? They don't feel a lack because they don't have jacu jacuzzi tubs or designer jeans. They don't feel any lack in those areas. Those things just aren't that important to them. What's important to them is a healthy, well-fed family that's at peace with each other. And they got a warm roof, uh, a warm roof house to be in, a roof over their head. And they feel extremely blessed if they have those things. Wait, you mean they don't have a hot tub? Yeah, they don't have a hot tub. They're okay. If you really do lack something that you really need, your heavenly Father is concerned about that. Okay. First John six, or in John sixteen twenty four, Jesus said this: "Until now, you have asked nothing in my name." Ask and you will receive that your joy may be complete. You know, God actually has an interest in your joy being complete. He actually is for that. The reason God wants you to ask is so that you'll receive so that your joy can be complete. I guess God actually is not holding out on you. He wants you to receive so that you won't experience lack. And if he wants your joy to be complete, I guess he doesn't want you to live discontented, does he? Okay. Luke 12, 29 through 32. And do not be concerned about what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the Gentiles of the world strive after all these things, and your Father knows what you need. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added. He didn't say seek his kingdom and forget about that stuff. He says, if you seek my kingdom, I'll add these to you. These things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father's pleased to give you the kingdom. Your Father is watching over you. Your Father doesn't want you to lack. Your Father wants you to have everything you need for life and godliness. He wants you to be fulfilled. He wants you to live in thankfulness and contentment. He actually wants that. It's his good pleasure to give you these things, right? The Bible shows us that the Father is actually concerned with me and you having all our needs met. He's actually concerned about that. Okay? 
Jimmy, Jimmy say he actually wants me um, to not walk in fear of lack? Exactly. You mean he actually wants me to have contentment and fulfillment? Yeah, actually he does, right? If we're not mindful of the enemy's tricks, though, we can begin to use the illusion of acts sometimes as an excuse for why we don't attempt to do something that God wants us to do. If I only had this, I'd, I'd try that. If I had a little more boldness, I'd step out and talk about Jesus to people, but I don't have that, so I, you know, that's for somebody else. You know, because I lack. I lack. What do you lack? Well, I like boldness, okay? I'd step out and minister if I just had a little more spiritual anointing. Eh, you, you do? Well, you got the Holy Spirit in you. That's got to be enough anointing. It says, for the anointing abideth in us, right? But if I had more knowledge of the Bible, I'd probably step out and talk to people. Then get more knowledge of the Bible. You can do that. It's right there for you. Eat it. The food's in front of you. Eat it. Who told you you lacked? The devil. Perhaps what you see as lack is actually an illusion that the devil's tricked you with. Here's a few things that the Bible says about what you have been given by God and you have and possess today. Whether you acknowledge it or not, this is what God says. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You don't lack any spiritual gift. So how many lack spiritual gifts? Well, I guess if you think you do, it's an illusion because God says you don't lack any spiritual gift. How could you lack a spiritual gift when the spiritual gift giver lives in you? right? And which gift is it that you said you lacked? <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this, who has already, past tense, blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So which spiritual blessings don't you have? He says, I've already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Yeah, but I don't see that. You've fallen for the illusion of lack. But I don't see it. Well, the devil's blinded your eyes to what you have. Because God says in, my, in his word, I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You go, well, you must have missed one. No, no, didn't miss any. All right? Okay. 2 Peter 1.3. By his divine power, God has given us, listen to this, everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. So what did you say you were lacking in your life that if you just had that, you could live a godly life? He says, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness, everything. No, I miss, I'm missing out on something. No, that's an illusion because you don't lack anything. 2 Timothy 3:16 through 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for instruction, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. Do you know you should be fully equipped for everything God calls you to do? Every good work. Not bad work, but good work. You're fully equipped. Really? I, I don't feel fully equipped. That's an illusion of lack. Which good work do you lack equipping for? Colossians 1.9. <clears throat> for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of the Lord. You know, bearing fruit in every good work. God has supplied all the things that you need, his Holy Spirit and his word, so that you can be fully supplied with everything you need to grow in him, to grow in the knowledge of him, to grow in the favor of the Lord, to grow and to produce fruit, every good fruit that there is to, to, to produce. God's set it up so that you can't lose if you just accept what he's done, right? Now, did you say you lack spiritual knowledge? It says there you get all knowledge and understanding. And because of that lacking of spiritual fruit, you know, I mean, I lack spiritual fruit because I don't have something. Well, maybe you just don't have the revelation of what you have. Huh? Maybe you need to start confessing what you have. Because when you confess that you lack, you're actually calling God a liar. Do you realize that? When God says, I gave this to you, you go, no, you didn't. You're calling God a liar. I gave that to you. You have it. I don't, I don't have it. Okay? Romans 10.10, for it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that that you profess your faith and are saved. King James says, with your heart, with the heart man believes in a righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So here's the thing. You're, if your mouth would stop confessing lack, Amen. 
and we start praising God for abundance, it would change everything. Did you say that you lack something that you can't put your finger on as a child of God, and therefore you're incomplete and you're insufficient? Well, Colossians 2.10 says, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You're complete in him. No, I lack something. No, he says, you're complete in me, actually. Now, we need to repent in a lot of areas because we've said God did not give us what he says he's given us. And we do not have what God says that we have. We need to repent. And what that means is it means, it means whatever way you're going, the thoughts are in this direction. You turn around, go the other way. Say, oh, I was wrong. I actually have. I've been saying I lack, I lack, I lack. But let me just say, thank you, I have it. Thank you, I have it. Thank you, I have it. I acknowledge every good thing that God has done for me. I acknowledge every good thing that God has given me. I do not lack anything for my godly life, for, for my fruitful life, for a spiritual life, uh, for anything that I need to please God. I don't lack any of that. And you don't either. Okay? Uh, we need to confess with our mouths what God says about us and stop confessing lack because that's what the devil says about you. Is God really a good father? Is he really a good father? Matthew 7-11. You know, if you need it, middle of the night, you go to 7-Eleven. If you then, though are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? When we confess lack, we are accusing the Lord of neglecting his children. You're a good father, but you, you've left me high and dry. I don't have this, and I don't have that, and I lack. When you know what you have, because you believe what God's word tells you, you have been given then by faith in that word, you can live in a place of contentment rather than lack. Well, maybe you can believe that today. Some of what you don't have is really something you don't need. You know, there's some things you don't have, like knowledge of evil. You really don't need it. Hebrews 13.5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you nor forsake you. You know, be content with, I'm not contented, I, need, I lack, I need a little bit more. God's left me out of the picture. He, he, he forgot about me, and he didn't give me, he's given it to others, but not me. You know, stop that. Tell that thing to shut up. Say, God's supplied all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Huh? I lack no good thing. Right? Start confessing with your mouth. Okay. What your mouth speaks is an indication of what your heart actually believes. Luke 6.45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. He says, I lack, I lack, I lack. You're calling God a liar. He says, I gave, I gave, I gave. No, but I lack. Let's begin a thankful and contented life today. By opening our mouths and confessing God's word over our lives. According to 2 Peter 1.3, it says today, it, it, it tells us this. According to that scripture, uh, 2 Peter 1.3, it tells us that today, right now, I have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Oh, but it's not true. You're calling God a liar. I think we ought to confess what he says. According to Hebrews 13.21, my God has equipped us for everything we need to do every good work he's ever called us to do. But no, I need one more thing. No, you're, you're believing the lie, the illusion that you lack something. According to Philippians 4.19, my God has supplied all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Right? According to 2 Corinthians 9.8, God has blessed me so abundantly in all things at all times that I have all I need to abound to every good work. I don't know, if I had enough, I'd, I'd help out. He says, you've, you've been blessed to abound to every good work. According to Romans 8, 37, in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror, more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. And every, any other thought to the contrary is simply an illusion. It's a lie of the enemy. And God doesn't want us to live a life of lack, but he wants us to live what's called the abundant life, the abundant life. So are you ready to start? Training your mouth to confess the right thing. Right? With the mouth. Confession is, or with the heart, man believes, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So let's begin to be thankful. Let's begin to be contented. Okay, so let's just confess this together. Say, I am complete in Him. I have everything that pertains to life and godliness. I have everything. 
every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. I am more than a conqueror. And no good thing has he withheld from me. Lack is a lie. And I'm fully equipped for his purpose. And I'm all sufficient in all things to carry out his work and to bear much fruit. Thank you, Jesus, that I lack nothing. And in you I have all things I need. And I'm thankful for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks again for coming. We love you. And uh, we encourage you. Tomorrow night is uh, prayer night. Uh, Wednesday night's Bible study. We encourage you to get in the things of God, get engaged, and grow. Okay? So that we can all bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.